Okay, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon in Indonesia, and good morning in Estonia and in the other part of Europe. Um, thank you for joining us on this uh, sixth lecture series uh, by Center for Strategic and Global Studies, uh, Department of International Relations, Universitas Erlanga, Indonesia. Uh, this is part of our uh, lecture series, our discussion and our workshop program targeted to discuss the ongoing debates, ongoing discussion, ongoing uh, events in, in the world. And we have discussed previously about uh, COVID-19 and its effect to uh, Southeast Asia, to Europe. Uh, we discussed, uh, last time we discussed China's hegemony in Southeast Asia. And today we will uh, touch on a different but also a very important case right now since we all know that uh, the current issues about Black Lives Matter uh, is still ongoing, uh, still very much uh, discussed in both uh, the, in, in, in the US where it started in Europe and of, of course, also in, in Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia, since we also have a very delicate relationship uh, within Indonesia regarding the race and uh, the issue of uh, discriminations. But uh, our focus today would be on uh, what happened in Russia, uh, how Russia perceived uh, this kind of movement, this Black Lives Matter movement, and whether uh, it actually affect uh, the way uh, Russia view themselves or its claims to global leadership with the other emerging powers. And to discuss that, we have a very distinguished speaker today, my supervisor, Professor Vyacheslav Morozov from the University of Tartu. Uh, professor Vyacheslav Morozov is the professor of EU-Russia studies and also the uh, the head of the council, UT Council uh, on EU-Russia studies, as, uh, the center for EU and Russia studies as well. Uh, he, well, he works a lot on Russian identity, foreign policy, and I think the last uh, few years he's been working on uh, post-colonial identity in Russia, uh, in which this discussion will be very much, uh, I think, of interest to all the participants, both in Indonesia and also the other part of the world. We have a participant from Russia, from Portugal, from the UK, and I believe that there were also, hopefully there will be some participant from the US as well. Uh, I will give the, the time to Fecheslav to start uh, his uh, explanation, his thoughts on this matter uh, around 20, 20, 30, 35 minutes, and then we can have uh, more time for discussion around, around 45 to one, one hour for discussion. Uh, Fetches, the time is yours. Uh, okay, good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Raditya, for the introduction and uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's actually a great pleasure to uh, be here with you with such an international crowd. Um, and as you said, uh, I think discussing this um, this, this particular topic uh, in the context of, um, uh, sort of greater Eurasia and also the significance of Indonesia for uh, Asian politics more globally and also the questions about uh, future global leadership and global uh, uh, governance. Uh, that's, I think, a very pertinent uh, setting um, uh, because we are, especially in this part of the world, uh, we, are, we, we, we tend to look westwards, uh, but I think it's also important to think about the repercussions about the current developments and trends uh, for the wider world, um, especially given that the world is becoming less and less um, US-centric. Uh, with uh, uh, the U.S. own efforts actually directing it in that in that um, uh, in that um, uh, kind of uh, field. So um, what I want to do today is to share with you some some thoughts. Um, and let me start the presentation now 
I'll mute my audio a little bit uh, and uh, start screen sharing. Um, yes. Um, so um, the um, idea is that first of all, it's not really a terribly original material, especially those who follow the developments in Russia will probably be familiar with most most of it. Um, but um, uh, so the, the presentation is intended, first of all, for the Indonesian audience uh, to give you a glimpse of what's going on in Russia in connections with in, conne in, in connection with Black Lives Matter and um, uh, the debate, the reaction to the protests in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, and uh, my idea is to just put it on the table and uh, throw a few thoughts about uh, what it means for the future global governance and uh, also Russia's uh, claim to global leadership, which as we all know, has been put forward very strongly. But I don't have any ready-made conclusions because we're very much in the middle of the process, right? So um, I just, uh, basically what I'm trying to do is introducing a puzzle or a certain problem uh, first of all, for Russia, but also for uh, the future international system. Um, and uh, I hope in the discussion we will actually try to unpack this and, um, and uh, introduce uh, various perspectives, because I definitely do not have any final judgment on this, on this issue. Uh, but before we do that, it's really necessary to uh, understand the context and what's going on in Russia and um, and, and, and the logic of the Russian reaction, which is actually, I think, a puzzle in itself, uh, especially given that Russia is so much, once again, uh, so much, has, has advocated so much the idea of uh, multilateral uh, institutions, multipolar world, uh, moving away from U.S. centrism and so on. This is, um, uh, I think, the reaction of the Russian society is really puzzling. And what is also, what, ne what needs to be also emphasized is that it's actually the reaction of the mainstream. It's not like the extremists. It's, um, it's mostly the mainstream which is puzzling here. So um, uh, let me start by uh, just saying, first of all, by way of introduction, that the discussion in Russia and the reaction to the protests in the US has been very lively. And I would say at times even hysterical. Uh, but in any case, there is a lot of interest. People do care. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, and uh, the second important thing is that most people are shocked. They are shocked by the um, radicalness of the movement, but of course they are shocked also by the TV picture. Well, the, the, the one that you see uh, here on the screen is just one example. Uh, it's, it, probably, it probably comes from a US source, but this is something that was used in the Russian media as an illustration to one of the uh, publications about um, the situation. And of course, the emphasis has been very much on rioting and looting and uh, fires and destruction of property and so on. When it comes to the reporting, the reporting is concentrated very much on that. And therefore, of course, people are even more shocked because they think that this is somehow incomprehensible. But what exactly they think, this is, this is the point of, of, of my presentation. Um, another thing is that, um, um, and, and it's actually very troubling for me, um, in particular is that there is very little compassion or sympathy or some sort of attempt to understand what's going on from the perspective of the protesters. Actually, at best, and I'm talking here once again, I'm not talking about uh, right-wing extremists. I'm talking about mainstream people who would usually be very sympathetic and, and actually take part in protests within Russia themselves. They would go to sometimes even unsanctioned marches. They would definitely support protests against uh, the Russian regime. And in this case, they're, they're at least um, they're puzzled and, and they, they don't understand how to figure this out. And at best they see protests as a problem that needs to be solved somehow. It's not a manifestation of something that is, uh, you know, has been long overdue, somehow expresses real concerns and real problems in society. It's a problem in itself that needs, needs to be dealt with somehow. 
Um, then, of course, there is a wide spectrum of opinions. Uh, there are predictable positions on the right and most of the left, most of the left, uh, self-proclaimed left, self-conscious left is uh, solidaristic. They, they, they actually support the protests. On the right, of course, it's, there is a lot of open racism and uh, it's not very interesting, it's nothing new there. But uh, what is interesting is that the liberal center, the mainstream, uh, is actually alarmed. And by the liberal center, I mean not just opposition, but also the pro-government uh, liberals, let's say. Uh, those who are sort of pro-system loyalist liberals who generally don't challenge the regime, but uh, criticize it sometimes from a li liberal perspective. Um, of course, the pro-Kremlin Kremlin media present uh, an image of total chaos, helpless uh, law enforcement, the U.S. is going down, the U.S. is in decline, but again, it's nothing new. They just get a new image. And uh, that's, that's, of course, important for them. They're happy about that, that they can show how terrible the situation is, all this rioting and looting. But in general, this is just normal propaganda. There is nothing new in that regard. Uh, what is interesting, as I said, is the re reaction of the uh, liberal center. Uh, there is a lot of conspiracy theories on all sides, except maybe for the progressive left, because they support protests, so therefore they actually see it as a genuine movement. Uh, for everyone else, um, uh, everywhere else, people are very, very inclined towards conspiracy, conspirological thinking. And they would explain it as the Democrats against Trump, or Trump against the Democrats, or George Soros comes into the picture quite often. And again, this is, you would be surprised how many people, even in the liberal part of the spectrum, sometimes invoke those uh, conspirological explanations saying that someone is masterminding the protests. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, someone has to fund it, someone has to organize it and so on. So it's really, a, really a, a surprising picture in that regard. But if you look at the arguments more closely, then you see something that you would expect, of course, and that's the first point here. I mean, yes, violence is very much emphasized, of course, even though, as you know, violence is, generally speaking, just a small portion of the, uh, of the whole movement. But uh, this is where the concerns are. Violence, lawlessness, destruction of property, looting. Uh, so basically, the message is protests must be peaceful. And uh, that's not surprising. That's something that you expect to see and hear from people who are faced with this TV picture, which is very dramatic, uh, over-dramatized, I would say, over-edited and so on. Of course, it's not interesting to show peaceful protests, uh, but uh, when you have some more dramatic to, to put on the screen, that's of course much, uh, much, much uh, more attractive for the TV people as well, regardless of, what, of the message they want to say. At the same time, I should say that some reporting has been balanced. I mean, it's not that necessarily you no know, pro-government media is just you know, terrible pictures of looting and so on. Uh, so the problem is actually acknowledged. It's not like people are completely in the dark about what's going, what, what is going on in the US, about racism, segregation, and so on. Um, but uh, then if you look at the, at, at the at other arguments, at, 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 especially that those arguments which are advanced from the center, from the liberals, then this is where interesting things come into the picture. Uh, a major, major topic is, of course, the apology that allegedly the protesters demand from uh, everyone, and especially from white, from whites, from white people. Um, and uh, of course, there is a lot of misinterpretation. There is a lot of talk about kneeling, putting people on their knees. Uh, and of course, no, it, it's very seldom mentioned that it's just one knee and, 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 and so on. And it's actually a sign of respect and, and, and so on. Well, I mean, you know the story, right? But um, a lot of fuss has been there about the fact that, uh, well, why do we have to apologize? We do not have to apologize. We are not guilty of, uh, we have not been slave owners. Uh, and most people who are today, the most whites today, of course, might be descendants of slave, of slave owners, but maybe most of them are not. And actually it's, um, it's unfair anyway, because there has been so many generations and so on, right? So it's not really, uh, in that respect, there's very little understanding that there is a show of solidarity and also that uh, it's actually about structural racism and people being violently treated by the police and law enforcement and uh, being killed and so on. That is somehow mentioned, but then it 
it, 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 it usually is somehow avoided in, in the end. And uh, the emphasis is that it's unfair to demand an apology from someone who didn't do anything wrong personally. Uh, then, of course, there is a lot of backlash uh, about affirmative action. It has been there for a while, but it's, 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 it's an old story, but now, of course, it's being discussed all the time. Uh, it encourages incompetence and, uh, and uh, it's not fair. Uh, it discriminates against the whites, against males and, 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 and so on. Uh, then if you move uh, towards more radical arguments, many people would say that African-Americans mostly have, have themselves to blame because they are, they're not doing enough to get out of poverty. And of course, this is where probably lack of knowledge actually is a key factor because people just don't, don't understand. And most of this, of course, is being written from a privileged position, but it's not a self-reflected privileged position. These people are well-educated. They're most metropolitan people from Moscow and St. Petersburg, or maybe other big cities. They are mostly, of course, those people whom we read, who, who, who publish online, they are mostly uh, privileged. Uh, sometimes they come from families with a certain uh, sort of legacies of privilege and so on and so forth. But this privilege is not self-reflected. And I will come back to that in a moment after I provide, provide my examples. But, uh, but the fact that African-Americans, the structural barriers that African-Americans face in uh, making it uh, to you know, better living conditions and so on, this is something that is not really uh, seriously discussed. Or if it's mentioned, then it's, it's not really appreciated the extent to which this can be a problem. Um, then, of course, there is an argument about the freedom of speech, uh, which to some extent, of course, is valid. And I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to say that none of these arguments are valid. None of these, uh, un, uh, of these criticisms are valid. Of course, there is some truth in those, in those criticisms. There are certain points which need to be made and need to be made kind of on the margins, but they become central points in the, in the debate um, in the Russian mainstream about the protests. So freedom of speech is obviously a very big deal, a very big thing here. Um, and then the whole thing about left radicalism, how dangerous it is uh, that uh, any radicalism is bad, but left radicalism is particularly bad because look at Stalin, look at those communists in China and elsewhere uh, who killed so many people, so many millions of people and so on. So is, is, is this where America is going? That's the question. And, of course, a separate topic are monuments. Uh, I, I'm not going to discuss it uh, in my presentation. If you want, we can come to that. But obviously, uh, many people are concerned that the destruction of monuments is vandalism. It's disrespectful, it's disrespectful of history. And uh, uh, it's actually, again, there's a problem there. Obviously, I admit that. But, uh, but uh, most of the... The discussion in Russia is heavily biased towards uh, this position that, no, monuments are history, they must be preserved. Um, there is a certain background to that as well. We can discuss it in the Q&A if you want. But um, I don't want to spend too much time uh, on that right now, because it's a kind of a side issue. Now, um, a few examples, uh, just to give it uh, some more concrete uh, uh, to, feel, to feel this structure with some more concrete examples. Well, the most vivid example is probably Xenia Sapchak. And uh, let me summarize the argument first, and then, and then I will show you fragments of the video that she published. And that's actually, that's one of the, the more like a starting picture from the video. As you, as you see, she is dressed like uh, the Joker character from the film. And uh, she actually, um, first of all, who she is. She is uh, uh, the daughter of the first mayor of St. Petersburg, Anatoly Sobchak, who was at some point Putin's boss uh, when he was the mayor. And uh, it, her family is very well established. And she is a, a, a celebrity. Her mother is a senator. She is really a, a privileged person um, uh, in many respects. She, she earns a lot. Uh, uh, on advertisement con uh, contracts, although actually some of them uh, have been interrupted after this video uh, by mostly by Western uh, uh, customers. So she is more or less like an opposition. She even ran against Putin at one presidential election, but she 
she is not exactly outside the system. I mean, she personally knows the president and they meet sometimes and they talk, maybe not too often, but they actually are in touch. So she's not, she, she is well established and well protected in that regard. Um, so in this video, she um, can contrast two films, Joker and Parasite, and Parasite she interprets as, uh, as kind of anti-left, uh, message, although I think this is this is questionable, but in any case, her point is that look at Joker. Uh, she says explicitly that uh, Joker is dangerous Marxist shit. That's her message, and that's the title of the video, even. And uh, then the statement is that you you, you have the a psychopath protagonist hooked on pills. He does nothing, blames the system for everything, kills, and gets applause. Eat the rich. That's that 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 that's what she says. And um, uh, she's worried that Soviet slogans have come to the US, that this, there's this left radicalism that is being spread there. And um, uh, on a, quite a funny note, if you look at it, I mean, for her it's not funny, but uh, um, for someone who looks at it from a different perspective, it's, it's, it's really funny when she tried, she starts to defend uh, Louis Vuitton and uh, Prada, uh, I mean, what, what do they have to do? Why, why are they looting uh, those shops? Uh, what, what, what are these shops to blame? Or are these brands to blame for the killing of uh, a black man and so on and so forth? So it's a, it's a really an interesting statement. And let me just show you the video. I will, I will probably, it's about three minutes, but uh, I will show just some fragments, uh, maybe the beginning and then a little bit uh, from the end. So, yes, sorry, I need to then start sharing. Okay. Называй меня Джокер! Вы справедливы! За равенство! За братство! Вы справедливы! За равенство! За братство! Ну что, вы не смотрели своего Джокера? А я, между прочим, еще в прошлом году в этих вот всех спорах говорила о приводителе Клиновой, Александру Роднянскому и Вике Толстогановой. Ваш Джокер не просто говно, а опасное марксистское говно. Совсем недавно мы все... Окей, я скроллю это вперед немного. ...в фокусе обязательно заканчивается разграбление... Yes, this one is. ...обязательно заканчивается разграбление магазинов типа Луи Дюкон и Прав. Причем здесь Луи Дюкон? Okay, that's probably enough. Uh, let me switch back to the PowerPoint. Um, um, yes, I hope you could uh, uh, see the video and I at least got a glimpse of it, right? It's, 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 it's kind of very dramatic, uh, again, in some respects over-dramatized. And uh, this funny passage uh, uh, about uh, she literally she's literally asking what does Louis Vuitton have to do with this? Uh, obviously, a brand very dear to her heart. I don't know, but um, um, uh, okay. Let me let me leave the conclusion towards the, uh, until the end of the presentation. Let me give you a couple more examples. Uh, quite a striking example, Mikhail Taratuta, a journalist who was actually famous for his very nice broadcasts, and this is a screenshot from one of his broadcasts from 92, I think, uh, I think it's San Francisco in the background, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was a serious America with Mikhail Taratuta, um, who, and actually it kind of opened uh, the United States to the Russian public. He traveled across the country, he talked to people, he showed like normal everyday American life. Quite interesting, actually. It was quite interesting to watch back then. Um, but uh, it's so surprising that now he came up with this rather long text where he criticizes affirmative action, says it might have been fair in the 70s, but no longer is. Um, and uh, it promotes um, uh, mediocrity and so on. 
uh, and also this very strong backlash against the left uh, radical and against left radicalism, leftist ideas. Students get indoctrinated on campuses. Campuses have become dangerous places in the U.S. Large cities are taken over by dangerous leftist ideology. And then uh, Black Lives Matter actually has no theory, but it joins forces with this leftist urban um, educated middle class. Uh, um, uh, lefties who are then uh, using it as a, as a force uh, to take uh, over America. And the Democratic Party short-sightedly encourages the protests, hoping to turn them against Trump, but this is really short-sighted because it will end badly for the Democrats, which might be true, by the way, but uh, that's, a, that's a separate topic, of course. Um, and uh, he also argues that small town America, which is true to its values, that it's really still American, unlike all those costs, it will resist and eventually, hopefully, the balance will be restored. But now, but now it's a very dangerous moment. That's his message. So as you see, very anti-left, anti anti-socialist, um, uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, and the third example is even more notorious, uh, Mark Salonian, who is, uh, sorry, I should have muted my phone, apologies for that. Mark Salonian, who is uh, a self-proclaimed historian, he's actually an aviation engineer by education, um, kind of opposition person in the sense that uh, the, the version of uh, World War II history that he promotes is not really in line with the official version because he blames Stalin for actually planning to attack Germany in June 1994 and therefore he was not really prepared to fight back when Germany attacked instead. And, uh, but, but, but he is also, he, he presents an argument that it's some, somehow similar to Taratutas, but then he goes into an even more radical uh, anti-black, really anti-black, racist uh, discourse where he says that African-Americans are the, just the battle force of those proletarians and lefties and um, they blame everything on slavery, but uh, it's actually, they, they, they have nothing to complain about because they have only themselves to blame. And then in one of his statements, he actually uh, um, said that, uh, or wrote actually in his, in his blog, that uh, uh, white people actually invested their money and there is their lives to bring Africans to the best country in the world. Complete anachronism, of course, but uh, never mind. And African Americans live much better than their fellow Africans back at home, and uh, no one even asks them to pay for the transportation. So a blatant racist statement, of course, which was deleted by Facebook, by the way, from his uh, from his uh, Facebook page. But you can still find it on his his uh, blog, um, uh, independent blog. So um, yes, so these are just the examples uh, that I wanted to share with you. And now let me let me try to offer an explanation why this is, why, why there is such a backlash on the part, again, of rather liberal people. None of those people are extremists or none of them have been or had been open racists before. They might have made statements which are not politically correct, but they were not really openly racist. At least, I mean, I'm not so sure about Salonin, but Sabchak and Taratuta probably were, were, had not been. So, uh, there, there are a few major points. Anti-racism is very much associated with Soviet authoritarianism, Soviet ideology. Um, so freedom of speech is not just there as a value, it's also a value because it was um, denied to the Soviet people during, uh, during the Soviet rule. And this is one of the reasons why it's so much valued, because it's associated with the Soviet trauma. Uh, there is a lot of allergy to socialism in any way among those people, the mainstream liberals of all generations, but especially, of course, of the older generation. But Sobchak is, you know, she, she is in her, what, her 30s, I think. So she's, she's from a younger generation. Um, and uh, there is also a claim to a certain maturity, certain special status here, because Russia, according to this discourse, is more mature due to its Soviet trauma. Uh, having lived through the Soviet times, uh, Russia has acquired a certain experience that makes it more prepared than the US. The Americans are less experienced in that regard. 
So Russia can teach Americans about uh, what to do. Actually, this is not new. This, this was there even earlier this year, very much pronounced um, when Bernie Sanders was making advances towards presidency. And I even wrote about this in a policy memo that was published, I think, back in February or March. Uh, about Russian reaction to the Sanders campaign. That argument was there as well, that we know what it means to live through socialism. So beware, we are telling you this is very bad. Um, another important argument, which was uh, nicely summarized by Lea Budraitskis uh, in his Open Democracy article, which is also available in English, it's about the loss of imaginary West. Uh, this image, idealized image of the U.S. is very important for Russian liberals. The U.S. in, in a way is a city on the hill for, for those people, not just for Americans. Um, and, and therefore being told about deep structural problems in the capitalist paradise is, produces not just cognitive dissonance, but also dislocates their identity. For them, for their identity, for their, their, their if you want, uh, ontological security, it's actually very important to know that there are countries which are normal, which, which you know, you can, you, take, you can take it as a model. And when you see such abnormality in, in the most normal country, the country that is supposed to be ideal, capitalist, uh, liberal, and so on society, you get problems with your own identification. Um, there is also sort of neoliberal undercurrent in this cult of personal success, individualism and so on, which of course justifies to some extent in the eyes of those people their statements that, uh, yes, well, uh, the, the uh, African Americans have themselves to blame because they have not been uh, working hard enough to get out of poverty and so on. And I would say that this is actually a legacy of the late Soviet period. Uh, and we can we can come back to this um, in uh, in a, a later discussion. But uh, I, I just to mention that here I use neoliberalism not just as a handy label, but as a form of critique, uh, that, uh, as referring to a form of critique which has been um, this this approach has been developed by St Stephen Collier in his um, uh, book on post-Soviet neoliberalism, and I think it's very much very much applies to the history of Perestroika times, Gorbachev's times in, in the Soviet Union, where the Soviet system was criticized from this very individualist, very kind of success-oriented perspective, anti-collectivist, and so on. Um, Another undercurrent here is, of course, un uh, what Rasen Jagalov uh, calls anti-populism of post-socialist intelligentsia. Uh, so late socialism, the time after Stalin, but especially 70s and early 80s, were a time of struggle inside the Soviet elites, uh, and not just Soviet, actually across the socialist camp. There were uh, in intellectuals who were putting claims to leadership, moral and political leadership due to their cultural capital. So they were trying to promote cultural capital as a form of, uh, uh, as, 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 um, as a claim towards leadership in, again, remodeling the society, in reforming the society and so on. And in Russia, I think the intellectual lost most spectacularly. In other countries, like such as Czech Republic, Hungary, at that time, uh, Hungary and Poland, the intellectuals got certain uh, say in how the reforms were conducted. In Russia, they were almost completely ignored. And this, again, this is a deep trauma for this generation of um, Russian Soviet intellectuals who actually continue to cling to culture and civilization as a form of uh, uh, discourse that protects their status in the society. Because we are the bearers of those values and we can tell you what civilized society means. And of course, again, when they see rioting, when they see protests that turn into violence sometimes, for them it's deeply troubling because they, they don't, I mean, they cannot really buy this as, as culture. And they also, are, what is also problematic for them is that um, uh, these protests are masses in the streets. They, these are probably poorly educated people who don't have a theory, who don't know what they want exactly, who just protest, destroy property and so on. And this is something that is difficult for these people to digest. 
And um, uh, this brings me to the uh, title of my talk. And in the last maybe five uh, minutes, I, I'm just, as I said, I just, I just put uh, on the table a few ideas about uh, Russia's international status. Because in, as I write in my book, uh, Russia is a subaltern empire, which uh, first of all colonized its own periphery on behalf of the West. Um, so, in a, in a certain sense, you can say that Russia was colonized by the West while remaining a sovereign uh, state. But what is most important is that, uh, in this regard, subalternity, uh, as per Spivak, involves not being able to speak. Right? Well, Russia speaks a lot, but what? But, but it speaks in a Eurocentric language, even while it criticizes Western unilateralism. It still um, it still uh, speaks the language which is very much oriented towards Europe. It claims for itself the position of a true Europe, or in this case, if you want, true civilization. Russia starts to, what, what the Russian intellectuals actually are saying is that, well, listen, our American fellows, our American uh, fellow intellectuals, um, you are losing it. You're losing your culture, you're losing your civilization. Look at our experience. Look at how bad socialism was and think again uh, before you support all those lefties or before you become a left to yourself. Uh, uh, protect your culture, protect your civilization. But this, this is, of course, a very Eurocentric language in itself. And uh, it's actually a form of critique which is which comes from inside this kind of Western civilizational discourse. It's just a little bit maybe out of date today. And uh, it also, it's also important that in this case, subaltern whiteness, uh, what, I, what I call subaltern whiteness, uh, is a way of protecting one's privilege. And this, is, this, this actually is valid both in terms of class, because those people who, are, who speak against the protests, uh, they are privileged people. They are intellectuals uh, who have established position within society. And they're, they're, they're worried um, because they feel that even now they are not acknowledged enough as intellectual leaders, as political leaders, their message is not being heard within Russia. But if, I think what, what their logic is that if uh, the protests are allowed to have their way in countries like in the US, then no one would listen to intellectuals, no one would actually listen to us, the bearers of cultural capital, even in the West. And, and that, will be, uh, that will be death for civilization, right? So it's a class concern. It's about one's own privilege, but it's also about uh, the country. It's also about the status of the country. And even if people are critical about uh, Putin's government and uh, Russia's policy and so on, they would still be uh, concerned about uh, what Russia has to offer to the world. And uh, in that regard, it's actually, uh, I'll probably skip this slide. It's actually connected with uh, complex legacies uh, of, uh, again, Soviet anti-racism, which was uh, often combined with open and covert discrimination. On this uh, postcard uh, in the right uh, corner, you see uh, it's actually eight, the 8th of March, International Women's Day. You see that it's very kind of international. There's an Asian woman, a European woman, an African woman, but it's also very patriarchal, of course. They're very feminine. Uh, they're not women fighting for their rights. Right? They're beautiful women who are to be adored. So that, that's, that's just one example of how it works. And then, of course, um, there is a lack of serious societal reflection on Russian colonialism and its legacies. Um, there is some talk, uh, some conversation about discrimination of, say, guest workers uh, from Central Asia, also of Russian citizens who are not of Russian, ethnic Russian origins, especially those who are racially different, such as people coming from uh, parts of Siberia, such as uh, in Russia's case, actually people, people coming from North Caucasus, they're also racially identified as different and so on. But at the same time, there is insufficient awareness of the global context of this, and also of the fact that Russia did have colonies and to some extent it still like it still still keeps its colonies in Siberia in particular and it exploits the colonies because this is where the resources come from this is where the wealth comes from and so on and um, 
And something that is very typical would be, uh, uh, well, now it's mostly online, but you can still see notes like this, one room apartment to let to a Russian family uh, long term. So uh, Russian family or Slavic family or only Slavs can apply. That, that's very common when people are, well, when people want to rent out the apartments. Uh, and it's just one example of this deeply entrenched uh, racism, which is not even reflected upon. And what is, what, what is even less and even worse in a sense is that uh, it's not put in the global context and in the historical context. It's not being reflected upon as part of global history of colonialism and racial discrimination and uh, the capitalist background and so on. So, you know, there's still this image that, okay, in the West, there are some problems, but generally all major issues have been solved there. Uh, the West is a model for us. We should aspire to be like the West. And therefore, uh, again, when you face evidence of deep structural issues in uh, the US or Western Europe, this troubles you, this becomes a, a, a problem. So um, to conclude, I think this might open up or bring to sight, bring to light a previously unseen, although I don't know how much unseen it was, a previously unseen flaw in the claim to global leadership. Because as we all know, since the 90s already, Moscow has aspired to lead uh, the hegemonic, the, or how counter hegemonic revolt against US dominance. Uh, Pro-Western liberals disagree with this project, but uh, they, they think that Russia should be part of the global leadership with the West. But uh, actually, uh, both camps uh, position Russia in the middle of the white world. And uh, uh, as it turns out, the ideas about civilization, modernity, progress, and so on are deeply racialized. And we understand it in our context, right? Every one of us has probably taught, has, has been taught, if we didn't uh, sort of reflect on this ourselves, but we have been taught that, uh, you know, you, 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 you can no longer use this language. You, you have to be, to take care not to be Eurocentric and so on. But we are in this kind of cosmopolitan academe. Whereas um, in uh, the context of the Russian debate, it's still, it's just, it, it just in the beginning um, in that regard. It's still new uh, to most people. Uh, and as I said, there is very little, very little reflection on the country's own experience uh, in, as, as a colonial empire. And I think this actually undermines Russia's claim to global leadership in ways that are eventually might be even more important than Russia's relative weakness or its uh, you know, inability to build strong institutions or its uh, unpredictable uh, or what some people see as unpredictable foreign policy and so on. Um, it's, um, it's something that potentially creates a barrier between uh, say Russia and Indonesia, right? Because, because eventually these issues will come up and uh, Russia's claim to whiteness, um, I think if it's not reflected upon and if, it, if it's not toned down and if it's not really somehow brought into line with the global discourse. This will be a problem for uh, diplomacy, just not just, not just for uh, sort of big projects like the BRICS or any others, but also for everyday diplomatic encounters. Um, and I think there is some evidence, mostly anecdotal, that uh, this problem is already there, but it might actually become more pronounced as we move through this period. Sorry for talking too long, but I think I'll stop here. And uh, thanks for listening. And I'm really looking forward to your questions and points that you would like to raise. Thank you, Fantasta. Very interesting uh, thoughts and information. And brings me to my own research. <laughs> I should have brought this up, but but I think uh, your last point about the Indonesia-Russia relations uh, and about anecdotal evidence that Russia is at least considered by the Indonesian diplomats that I thought that I that I that I uh, that I interviewed uh, as acting like a a 
not not only as a big brother but uh, kind of belittling other countries in 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 Southeast Asia, which is very interesting because because you you also mentioned about these problems of uh, uh, solidarity uh, when, when Russia tries to be this kind of leader of the of the counter hegemonic uh, force in in the world, but then they also act like a hegemonic country within the region, which is which is very interesting. Uh, I think we already have some questions. Uh, I'll move on to, to the Lisa Gaufman, if you want to ask. Uh, it, okay, uh, she, she's not in, uh, in our video, but, but uh, the question is about during the Soviet era, there was a lot of anti-American propaganda in the press for, that focused on human rights policies in the US. Uh, and, and why do modern Russians not remember any of this now? Maybe you have a comment on that. Uh, sorry, your, your microphone, I think. Is... Yeah, yeah, yes, sorry, yes. Could you repeat the last point? Uh, uh, it's, point? it's why do modern Russians not remember any of this now I, about the racist policies in the US? Uh, in, I mean, in, in, during the Soviet era, there was a lot of anti-American propaganda. Uh, okay, okay, yes, I, I, yeah. I got that. I just, it, okay. there was a little glitch in the transmission when uh, okay. the last sentence. Um, I think it's, it, it has to do mostly with the fact that, um, I mean, the Soviet legacy is remembered in a very interesting way in Russia, uh, because the, the pro-Kremlin uh, version, as those who monitor it, I'm sure know, it, it's very imperial. Uh, what is uh, emphasized is greatness, uh, achievement, modernity, civilization, but uh, definitely not internationalism and definitely not anti-racism and so on. Because this is something that is deeply problematic. It's too, um, I mean, the, 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 in general, the, uh, the ideology of the current regime could be called counter-revolutionary. That's probably one of the major elements of this ideology. So anything that has to do with mass movements, with grassroots movements is uh, at least under suspicion. And it will be very conspirological and so on. So that's, that's the official part. Uh, the alternative part, uh, the opposition is, as I said, is allergic to anything socialist or Soviet because they think that uh, uh, it was mostly the Soviet period when Russia kind of deviated from the normal course of history. So therefore they're also allergic to uh, internationalism, anti-racism because they see it as um, um, sort of hiccups or whatever of Soviet ideology, something that is uh, that, that, that takes us to the past rather than to the future. Uh, and, uh, but, but obviously there is, a, there is an increasingly visible um, community of progressive left in Russia, mostly younger people in their 30s or 20s even, who, are, um, might, who have a much more balanced view of the Soviet uh, period. Some of them might be probably too much fascinated by by the Soviet project, but generally it's a, it's a very wide spectrum of opinions. And most of these people, of course, they're not Stalinists in, in that sense. They, are, they might be in favor of state regulation and so on, and they might actually see some, 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 some good in the Soviet project. Um, and those people, of course, are ready to embrace uh, this agenda. And they are visible. They are now visible. They, they, there, is a, there, is a, there is a strong presence of this, uh, of this community in the media, uh, online media, of course. But uh, in the overall picture, they're still relatively marginalized. They're not present on major, some, let's say like something like Echo, Echo Moscow, Echo Moscow, one of the main uh, outlets of free speech, remaining outlets in the relative mainstream because it's actually a broadcast radio. It's not just, you can, you can, actually listen to it in your car as you drive from Moscow, St. Petersburg, or any, uh, any other big city. You can turn it on and listen to it. And uh, you, you won't hear those views there, right? It's not, it's not something that would be present in, in, in the broadcast media. Uh, online, yes, quite a bit of that. So um, I think, yes, it's about the fact that the Soviet, uh, the Soviet project is remembered very selectively. Thank you, Chester. But there is also one uh, raise, raise hand from Rene Patera Jawan. If you 
can join us pa rin eh. Uh, thank you, Radito. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Mozorov. It is a very intriguing uh, 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 presentation that you have. My name is Rene, Rene Patria Dewani. I'm the chairman of the Center for Ch uh, Chinese Studies. And I work as a journalist before for about 32 years. My, my question will go like this. It seems to me that all that issues that related to a social disruptions in the U.S. or in the in the uh, in in the European continents is merely a remnant yeah, of a past historic historical memory settings that has been understand only in a part by the society itself. Being in a wide world, I think also there is also a, a feeling of angriness yeah, between of the, the of the injustice uh, 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 social structures due to economic uh, development. That, that is one thing. On the other part, I'm 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 not familiar with what's going. Uh, happen in the in the Re European or the U.S. Uh, uh, social uh, 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 development, but I think the problem is we are. Uh, 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 the question is like this: Are we going to go back again in an era where, for example, before the 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 side uh, the the Rus the Russian Japanese war? has been uh, an intriguing uh, uh, reaction from the Asian nations toward the Western domination. This is an, an, an issue that, because if you look back at the, what happened in the, in the U.S. regarding to the Black Matters uh, issues, is, is, being, is being spread, spread uh, quite a lot of of issues not only regarding to the Afro-American society, but also to the other uh, 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 ethnic group, the Chinese. Yes, uh, we, have, we hear a lot about the Chinese. We, 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 we rarely heard about the Japanese, but there is some cases, I think, that is also happening uh, uh, regarding to this anti-racism uh, 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 sentiments. Yeah? So the question is, are we going back to that particular era that a rise of a nation, a rise of a, of a culture, a rise of a civilization that wants to be recognized as equal as the white supremacy? Yeah. Uh, previously, is 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 being is being pushed up by the Japanese because of the Meiji Restoration. Now you have the Chinese who is much more scarily compared to the Japanese because they, they, they control all your life from your hand from your from your from your refrigerator in the in the kitchen from your whatever uh, electronic products that have you been used in the main developed country that is the majority of the white uh, uh, ethnicities and 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 and, and uh, cultures cannot accept that is a reality that is being neglected widely I'm trying to see this as an as an as a formulation and a projection of how international relation is actually being endangered yeah, because now we are in a situation that we cannot talk to each other. I mean, with all the, the, the development of technology, I mean, language barrier is no, is no problem at all. We'll have any kind of language that you want to speak to each other. There is a machine that can do that. So do you think, are we stuck in a situation where we're coming back when 
supremacy means that you need to have a big muscles to say, look, we are a part of this. Thank you, bro. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, it's actually, uh, thank you for this question. It's, uh, and there is a lot to reflect upon, of course. One thing that um, I think needs to be mentioned is that um, there is a big difference, I think, between China's uh, claim to leadership and what happened back, uh, let's say, in the late 19th, early uh, 20th century, in the sense that, um, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert, but from the books I read, uh, for instance, there is a great book by Shogu Suzuki about uh, Japanese uh, claims to leadership. There was exactly this claim to whiteness, you know, being civilized, being part of the uh, civilized uh, group of empires that was uh, in the center of the Japanese imperial project, um, in, especially in the early 20th century. I don't think China is, is doing anything like that. China is content with its own identity. And, um, uh, but, but what we, uh, but, 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 but uh, to go on with your argument and kind of go along with your argument, I would say that what is happening right now is that indeed we're not talking to each other because everyone has their own perspective. I think the, the Western world, as also the current developments show very well, uh, not just in Russia, but also in the US, look at Trump and, and the Republicans in general, and, um, and, and, and Europe is also very problematic in that respect. The Western world is somehow still locked in its whiteness. It's still, I, I think there is still a lot of dismissive attitudes to uh, Asians, to the Chinese in particular, um, you know, there's still a tendency to identify civilization with Europe, even though in terms of the distribution of power in the world, this is no longer the case. You can, of course, discuss and debate to what extent the center of global power has shifted towards China, but it's definitely going there, right? And Asia is becoming um, increasingly more important globally. So in that respect, uh, you can say that, uh, um, that um, we need to adjust to the new situation. But the, the problem exactly is that um, uh, the, 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 there is no language we can, we can talk, there's no shared language we can use for that because uh, the Chinese, as I understand, seem to be very inward looking and very kind of selfish in many respects in their, in their pursuits of uh, global leadership. Um, uh, the West is still, uh, still claims the leadership for itself, but it's increasingly losing the position. And especially what Trump is doing now is actually uh, is a great contribution to that because uh, his decision, for instance, to quit the uh, WHO is one example where you really just abandon leadership, where you have it, potentially at least. And historically speaking, you have the leadership, but you give it up. Um, and uh, at the same time, the peripheral countries like Russia or Brazil, to some extent also India, uh, I, I would say they, my impression is that Brazil under Bolsonaro has the same problem as Russia. They, they also claim some sort of whiteness to themselves. You know, they, they claim that they are, uh, they're supposed to be, you know, Brazil is for Brazilians, the Amazon is for Brazilians, uh, we need to develop, uh, we are a great country. Uh, we should not be humiliated and so on and so forth. All, all this language, uh, which is actually associated with, first of all, European imperialism. And uh, it's, it's very inward looking, all of that. Um, the same is going on in Russia and so on. And actually what I think is, is, is lacking is uh, the understanding that we need to, first of all, talk to each other and also we need compromises. We need to continue building institutions, whereas what is going on is uh, what is going on right now is more about destroying the institutions uh, that we have, and um, it's very sad, I think. Um, but um, what I was trying to highlight in my presentation is that there are certain elements of the outlook that actually prevent countries and national leaders from engaging with each other. Uh, because I think Russia right now is in a great position to actually claim part of 
its part in the global leadership. Uh, regardless of all the consequences of Crimea and so on, these are very serious, of course, and I'm not dismissing that, but looking at the US, looking at where Europe is globally, uh, generally speaking, if Russia wanted to grab the leadership, this would be the moment for that. Talk to the Chinese, but also talk to the Indonesians, talk to the Indians, talk, try to talk to the Brazilians in as much as possible. I think Bolsonaro would be able to find a common language with Putin uh, easier than with many other global leaders. And try to, try to see what you can do to solve the real world problems. The pandemic, climate change, uh, I don't know, uh, international migration, all those issues uh, you can actually try to build alternative institutions that would be less U.S. centric, but this is not happening because Russia is still obsessed with the U.S. and they're looking only westwards. They, they, they don't really um, feel like they need to uh, seriously engage with Asia, apart from just promoting the very narrowly understood uh, interests. And that's, I think, this is a problem, indeed. Thank you, bro. Thank you, Parini. Uh, we have another question from one of my students, uh, former student, uh, Iqbal. Uh, you, can you turn on your video as well and then ask uh, your question directly? Yes. yes uh, thank you, Professor. So I have listened to your explanation. I'm quite interested in your points and explanations regarding on how the current Russian society may somehow still be considered as a racist and a court, especially when input in relations to the current situation uh, in the United States. And in your opinion, is there a possibility that the situation in Russia may change? And if there indeed is a possibility, will it be driven by political motivations or just a pure awareness on racism in the modern world? Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, we can only guess, of course. I don't know whether the situation is going to change, but uh, there are some good signs, actually. Um, right now, as we speak, there is, um, uh, there is a strike of uh, delivery workers going on in uh, Moscow. Uh, and these people are mostly, let me say, non-white. They're mostly labor migrants from Central Asia. Uh, so it's not like, you know, your usual uh, white, uh, proletarians, uh, like coal miners, for instance, uh, back in the 90s, who would uh, strike all the time. Uh, it's actually a, a strike which is, uh, to some extent, th there, is, there is an obvious racial dimension, and the dimension of racial discrimination in what these people are protesting against. Although predominantly they are protesting against the working conditions, pay conditions and so on. Uh, it's actually, as you know, it's, it, 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 these people are overexploited, obviously. Um, so, and 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 it, there, there is some support for that, and there is also. It seems that the authorities do not really try to put it down in any way. They're trying to keep it under control, but given the overall situation in the country, maybe they will change their mind. But uh, given the overall situation that it's very tense right now after the voting on the constitution, which has been very problematic in many respects, the pandemic and so on, I think it's a good sign that they at least allow these people to have a voice. Uh, and again, it's not only about the Kremlin and what the Kremlin does, but the society is also showing some signs of support. Uh, so it's, there is a potential that um, uh, by looking at, at what is essentially an imperial legacy, right? Those guest workers from Central Asia is a legacy of empire. These people speak Russian, at least to some extent, because they have been previously, their, their ancestors have been colonized by Russia. Now they're independent countries, but uh, there is still a lot of legacies and a lot of poverty and so on. And they come to Russia to look for, for work uh, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg and so on they face those conditions which are unbearable sometimes and uh, they start to claim their rights. And this is a very important turning point. If the society does not turn against them on racial grounds, then I think there is a hope that there will be more discussion. And as I said already, there is discussion going on. There is interest in uh, the issue of uh, colonialism and uh, Russia as a colonial empire, a continental empire, and so on. It's mostly academic. 
but it's being there is some spillover from the from academe into wider society and i hope that eventually with uh, the new generations coming in uh, who are more interested in those unorthodox perspectives on Russian history, who are maybe fed up with this official narrative which they are being taught at school, you know, every, at every point, how great the Russian state was and so on. Um, maybe they will uh, eventually, there will be space for such a discussion. So in that respect, I'm optimistic, but for the time being, this space is too narrow, I would say. And the society is, as I said, too ignorant basically uh, about its past important elements of its past and uh, to some extent it's the state which is to blame but not just that because the discussion is still in the country the discussion is still relatively free I mean, online you can discuss many things and uh, this uh, in in that regard uh, i think uh, there is more to be done thank you professor um, yes, uh, we have one more questions from one of my colleagues, uh, but she couldn't deliver it by herself. So I will, I will formulate it for Fiatchesto. This is actually connected to what you mentioned, uh, but you skipped during your, during your presentations, you got monuments, uh, the, the toppling and destruction of monuments. I remember several days ago, we, uh, several of our colleagues in Tartu have a very interesting discussion on Facebook as well regarding this uh, uh, toppling of the monuments. Uh, she actually asked uh, about whether it actually works, uh, this kind of toppling of monuments, or do you think it's kind of vandalism? Or I would ask what you think about this kind of uh, narrative of uh, destroying history. Uh, you, you, you mentioned that the Russians, uh, the, the discourse in Russia thinks that it is uh, part of this kind of uh, destruction of history. The monuments, monuments represent hist uh, our history, so we, it shouldn't be destroyed. Do you do you agree with that uh, the, that uh, assessment, or do you have uh, uh, other points? Uh, well, in a nutshell, no, I don't. I don't agree with this interpretation. Um, uh, listen, uh, I'm not I'm not for destroying monuments, and actually. You know, imagining St. Petersburg without the bronze horsemen, for instance, for me would be, hmm, I would be sad. I would be, I would be saddened by that. Um, because it's a, it's a great place in itself. And this monument is so central to the whole area. It's a beautiful monument. Um, but um, what I can say about that is that, um, uh, first of all, if the society is fine with the monuments as they are, then let them be there. It's not a problem at all. Uh, when certain monuments become problematic, well, ideally, of course, it needs to be discussed. Uh, but uh, sometimes when the situation becomes so dire as it is today in the US, then even toppling of the monuments can be justified in my view. And in general, of course, let's not forget that very seldom those monuments get destroyed. They're actually just uh, removed, toppled. They might be damaged a little bit, but then you can repair them, put them in, in a museum and so on and so forth. It's not, it's not like it's completely destroyed and you know, blown up and uh, uh, shattered into pieces and so on. Um, uh, and uh, indeed, you know, think about this from a black person's perspective you know, an African-American who walks down this street every day and there is this statue reminding him or her about, the, about slavery, humiliation, uh, exploitation, and so on. And it's, it's, it's like, you know, the white people don't notice it, but those who, are, who were on the other side of this colonizing uh, crusade, they sometimes notice it and it's painful. And it's like... A, uh, it's like a serious matter for, for those people because it's about recognition of, of their value as, as members of the community, right? So I, I, I certainly understand the logic behind toppling of the monuments, uh, but I do not support it. At least I do not support it uh, wholeheartedly uh, because um, I think it's, a, it's also a distraction for the moment. 
because there are more important issues to focus on. And these issues have to do with structural problems, with uh, not just structural racism per se, but also the economic aspects of it. The fact that, uh, for instance, in the US, the society remains deeply segregated and uh, there, are, there are still such huge barriers to social mobility vertical and also horizontal, I mean, like geographical mobility in many areas of the US, that uh, these are much more important issues. Like take the, the, the infamous uh, Flint, Michigan story with the water contaminated there. And uh, I mean, it's, it's still there more or less. I mean, it's improved a little bit, but it's not, it's not solved. So um, uh, these, these stories, I think, are much more significant because um, monuments are only the top of the picture. It's, it's just the tip of the iceberg, in a way. Symbolically, it's important, but what is more important are structural issues which affect people's daily lives. It's not, what I'm saying is not about, it's not, it's not economic reductionism that I am ad ad advocating here. It's not just, you know, the economy is stupid. No. What I'm saying is that uh, there are structural issues which have to do with the economy, but they also have to do with how society works, how people get recognition in life and so on, which are much more profound than just some statues out there. And uh, so my position is that I don't care personally about those statues. They're not part of my life. They're not part of my history. If people want to topple them, I do not object. If people would want to topple Peter the Great statue to the Bronze Horseman in St. Petersburg, I would probably be against it, but then I would uh, be open to a discussion and uh, definitely talking about, you know, finding a possible solution and so on and so forth. But fortunately, Peter, I mean, for all his uh, faults, Peter can probably, uh, it's more like, if he was an oppressor, the, his main victim were the Russian people. I mean, he, he's personally, right? He's not, he didn't do that much in terms of colonizing other areas. Yes, the Russian empire expanded under his rule, but he, it was not his personal, what, what he's remembered for. What he's remembered for is building St. Petersburg, which was of course a huge imperial enterprise. A lot of people died in the process and so on, but these were, yeah, maybe Finno-Ugric people could actually have a grudge against him uh, because they populated the area back then and uh, now uh, it's almost lost. But again, as long as it's not, uh, as long as, as these people do not present any claims, uh, I think the statute must be there. If there is a problem with that, we will discuss it. That's my ideal image. Thank you for your testimony. I think it, it reflects back on you what you uh, wrote on Facebook as well. It's quite, I mean, it's, it's, it's similar to that. Okay, uh, we have another question from, um, okay, two questions actually, one from us, uh, from my friends Agast and the other one from Demas. Uh, I'll go to Agastya first. Okay, thank you, Mas Rabbit. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Vyacheslav for the lecture. It is new insight for us because I'm not uh, much familiar about Russia. I'm studying about United States foreign policy, of course. But uh, one interesting point that I would like to ask, this is based purely on curiosity, because in the United States, especially during Trump presidency, the discourse about Russia is surfacing and it's one of the most uh, highly discussed discourse. The discourse in the United States said that Trump presidency give advantage to Russia, give uh, uh, because Trump is closer to Russia. My first question is, did Russia really gain something from Trump? That's my first question. And then my, my second question, in these election years, because in the last election that there are uh, allegations of Russian involvement during Trump election, uh, and election is become important not only for the Russia particular, but for the world. Who is the next US president? In your opinion, how will Russia respond? Will he, will Russia support Trump or Biden or which one, which one candidate is much more favorable for Russia in the coming uh, global order? Thank you. That's my two questions, Professor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I think it's an important uh, dimension of the whole discussion, of course, the uh, US politics, uh, US politics and, and in general, the elections and so on. Um, where shall I start? Mm. Let me start at the end, because that's, that's, that's a concrete question, right? Does Russia support Trump? Yes. 
do we know what it does? Well, not quite. I mean, they probably do engage, uh, do use some tools. Um, some of them are perfectly legal, some of them somehow in the gray zone, maybe some of them are even, even violate certain international norms. They probably do try to interfere with the elections uh, to tip the balance in favor of Trump. And maybe they did so in 2016. Did it really tip the balance? Well, I don't think so, because uh, there, there were other much more important factors uh, than Russia's involvement. Um, they would certainly be interested in four more years of Trump, because obviously this makes the US it's actually difficult to deal with Trump, but at the same time, it makes the US less focused on Europe and less focused in general, right, in the first place, but also less focused on Europe, uh, on the Baltics, for instance, uh, on NATO and so on. And uh, in that regard, uh, of course, Trump is good for Russia because uh, it can feel more secure and also uh, maybe do certain things which uh, they want to do in their area. And also, of course, Ukraine becomes important because Trump obviously is not interested in Ukraine at all, right? So in principle, yes, they would support Trump. They certainly would not want Biden uh, because uh, the Democrats are, have made it a point that they are against Putin, against Russia, and uh, they are very deep in that policy and that discourse, and they will have to do something, obviously, if Biden wins. So in that regard, I think um, uh, they would try to support Trump. But again, I don't think it's material in the sense that what they can do possibly is, is strongly exaggerated in the US media. And in general, I don't like this obsession because it again, it's a distraction. It's like the monuments and even worse. Because with the monuments, at least there is symbolic problem which can hurt feelings of many people who pass this monument every day. With Russia, I mean, whatever Russia can do can be contained, obviously. And you can do it in a more quiet way, in a more kind of business as usual way. Okay, yes, you have this country which is nasty to you. Well, do something about this, but don't make such a fuss. Because then you actually shift the focus away from the really serious issues, such as structural racism, for instance, or such as the economy, or such as the pandemic, or such as climate change. And you start blaming Russia for everything, including, for instance, there, is, there are already reports, you might have seen them, about Russia's disinformation about Black, Black Lives, Lives Matter and so on. Okay, maybe there is some disinformation. How important it is? I don't think so, because as I, as I try to show in my presentation, in general, the, Lush, the Russian establishment does not understand the problem. So they cannot meaningfully intervene because they don't understand what the problem is. They might ignite some violence, they might post some uh, sort of inflammatory comments uh, on Facebook or elsewhere, but it's not really, I mean, there are enough people who are making inflammatory comments uh, on the social media anyway. So. It's not something that I would be uh, very concerned about, at least in this context. Um, that's, I think, is a problem. I mean, I don't deny that Russia tries to do something and they, they, sometimes they're very nasty. Sometimes they do things which are illegal and uh, we have certain evidence of that. But at the same time, uh, exaggerating this factor takes the attention away from problems which are more serious. And uh, uh, if I were a US Democrat right now, I would be uh, encouraging and even urging my colleagues to focus elsewhere and focus on real issues. Because these, these issues, after all, are much more important for the real people living uh, you know, everywhere in the United States, maybe outside of the of, of, of Washington, D.C. Okay, thank you, Professor Christensen. Thank you, and thank you, Augusta, for the questions. Uh, we, we still have around 10 minutes, and we have another question from Demas. Demas, are you there? Yes? Are uh, you Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor and uh, Mas Ari, for uh, the lecture and the chance. So, Professor, uh, I think 
what I would like to ask here is a question that has been lingering in my mind since the beginning of the movement, which is how important is it actually for us to learn uh, or to see racism in historical context? I actually kind of raised this question because uh, I heard your um, uh, opinion about uh, the monument uh, taking downs and uh, a few other uh, parts of the movement, the violent part of the movements uh, uh, before, in which what, uh, and we can see that um, historical reju rejuvenation, historical revivalism is something that has been a constant theme in the movement. Um, so my question is that can people or the past itself is actually could be blamed for the structural racism that is happening uh, right now? Uh, is it actually like a salutive way to um, to actually put forward this sort of symbolic uh, movements or acts uh, in in exchange for perhaps a better policy making or a better uh, steps in the future? And do you think that you know figures the the statues people in the statues like Winston Churchill or other statues are actually responsible for the kind of um, eviction that is being put out by the movement recently. I think that is my question. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Again, this is a very complex issue, of course. And uh, maybe one thing that I should uh, say in response to your question, especially the last part about the responsibility, something that uh, I could have also said in response to the previous question about uh, the monuments. Um, Sometimes what we hear is that uh, those people cannot be judged by today's standards. Um, well, you know, but the monuments are there today and they symbolize something. I mean, if, if, if a monument is there in the public space on a pedestal above the people, it actually means that this person gets recognition from us now, here and now. It's not, it's not that they recognized him, they acknowledged his contribution, mostly his, right? Um, not her, usually. His contribution to our history like 100 years ago and that's it. No, it's actually today that we are still honoring this person if the monument is still there. And that is what problematic, not the fact that they put this monument up 100 years ago, but the fact that uh, it's still there today and it's actually part of our symbolic space and our memory and so on. Um, uh, so in that sense, I think uh, we do have to hold those people responsible for what they did, uh, while also acknowledging the, the contribution to what we see as valuable, such as Churchill, for instance, I mean, his, his, his war effort, of course, um, cannot be denied. But he was an imperialist, an open imperialist, and he, he did defend the, the British Empire. Uh, and that, I think, should not be forgotten. Um, and uh, generally speaking, I think uh, uh, it's um, it's an important dimension. But as I said, and I think you pointed out, uh, pointed this out in your question as well, um, can this movement actually succeed in addressing the structural issues? Well, I don't know. I think so far the success has been mixed. Uh, I think the uh, argument about the police reform and um, uh, changing the way cities are policed and attempts, real attempts, to reform uh, the police in some of the states. This is a big achievement already. Um, let's hope that in general it will also change a lot in terms of policies and so on. But I, I sort of, I, I, I am skeptical a little bit about changing the U.S. police as an institution. I think it is uh, infected with uh, structural racism and unfortunately it's, it, it, it's just reforming the police probably will not solve the problem. It must be something bigger. But, um, um, but um, so far the movement has not achieved much in terms of addressing structural, structural problems. I admit that. And uh, I mean, yes, I'm also critical about the movement in many respects. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, a, a, a kind of just one-sided supporter of it. But at the same time, I think it, it, it's an important sign, it's an important uh, indication to the establishment that something needs to be done. And this something, um, 
I think is about trying to build a coalition now, and it can be built from below as well as from above. Unfortunately, there is very little effort from above, uh, especially with Sanders now being out. Well, let's see what happens with uh, other younger people in this camp. Maybe they will be able to somehow open up and try to build a coalition between Black Lives Matter on the one hand and uh, let's say uh, white blue collar workers on the other hand because obviously these two groups are among the most discriminated and disadvantaged in society and also of course the latinos on the other hand and so on so i mean the issue of race must be at some stage overcome it's important to state the message to to, to send the message to say yes we are oppressed as african americans but then what do you do with that do you want to be protected only as as an african american or do you want to live in a better society. If you if you want to live in a better society, then you must build coalitions with other groups that are out there. Uh, there is some effort uh, in that direction, and I probably don't know enough to be honest about what's going on. But I see it from the media that yes, people are reflecting on this. But it's an incredibly difficult task, especially given how entrenched identitarian politics is in the U.S. in particular right now. So we have to go beyond this. There is no other way. We, we, and, and actually, for instance, feminist movement, the feminist movement has a lot to contribute in this situation. If they're capable of uh, leaving their, you know, the, the comfortable ground, the comfortable you know, space that they created for themselves and going into, back into men's world, uh, if I may put it this way, um, and um, uh, try to uh, build an alliance of progressive forces, which would then, of course, contribute very, very much to Black Lives Matter, because so far, you know, the quintessential image of uh, a BLM supporter is a black male, right? Strong, uh, strongly sort of demanding a position. But then yes, where's the woman there? Uh, that's a big question that, that feminists have to ask and they should not shy away from asking this question, but in a friendly way, not like, you know, you're forgetting about women, so you are hopeless. No, uh, just let's, let's think about uh, women's part in this struggle and let's, let's uh, think what can be done. And uh, again, there is, there is a space for, uh, for pooling resources because feminism in the US in particular, it's a very strong movement. And it can contribute a lot into this um, in, in, into the struggle. So that's that's basically uh, the point. Thank you, Professor. Uh, okay, thank you, Hesha. Uh, we are approaching the end. I think four minutes. We we still have four minutes left, and I do have questions about the the, the, the claims to global leadership part of your presentations. Uh, I think I've mentioned it before and also pa uh, Rene also mentioned it, uh, whether this idea that Russia, uh, at least you mentioned that the, the elites, the, 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 the policymakers and the academics in Russia, in Russia try to see this as a, protecting their culture, protecting civilizations, but at the same time, you also mentioned that they are trying to portray themselves as part of this new, uh, this counter hegemonic force with China, with India, with Brazil, with the other part of, uh, countries in Southeast Asia, uh, Vietnam probably, Indonesia. So how would they deal with that in the, in the, in the next few years? If this kind of, uh, people start to see this, this, this idea that Russia feels themselves as, again, as European, we, we, we already discussed it before, but then countries in, in, in the other part of the world start to see Russia not as part of them, but part of the, 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 the old order, the, the, the Western uh, order. So how would this play out in, 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 in the next few years, especially in this, in this kind of, uh, so you have the US on the one hand declining or, try, uh, or forget about their responsibility to the world. And then you have the other countries try to feel uh, Russia or China as this new big countries, but then uh, Russia is actually, a, you know, it it's turns towards Europe more than to Asia or the other countries. So uh, 
I don't know. Do you have any comments on that situation? Yes, I do. I, I cannot predict, of course, what's going to happen. But briefly, what I can say is uh, look at the post-Soviet space. I mean, this is what can happen if Russia is not careful enough. And if it's not, if it doesn't really make an effort, if the Russian diplomacy doesn't make an effort to somehow come to terms with the race problem, which is becoming very central in today's world for a number of reasons, uh, US protest is, is only one of them. Um, if they don't do that, then they risk ending up in the same position they are already in, in the mm -hmm. post-Soviet space, where everyone suspects Russia of bad intentions. Uh, some countries are very vocal about it for obvious reasons. Georgia, Ukraine would be prime examples. Other countries are just wary, but they are also, you know, privately you would hear a lot about potential Russian threat and imperialism and so on. And uh, the fact that, again, Russia do, does not want to, the Russian elites, including mainstream intellectuals, do not care about the imperial legacies, do not care to talk about colonialism and what it means today and its legacies and so on. Um, it already means that Russia is somehow, it, it, it lost, it has lost its standing in the post-Soviet space that it used to have, not maybe with Ukraine, okay, but with, uh, but even with Ukraine it was much better, but say Central Asia, it's actually quite mixed. Yes, ordinary people are more positively inclined towards Russia, elites are kind of more cautious and so on. Uh, but yes, it, 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 it risks losing its position uh, and also globally because eventually uh, you would need, if you're really, if you're really serious about your counter hegemonic effort and you are, your alternative future and so on, you need to build a serious alliance. You need to cooperate respectfully with other people. And for that, you need to be sensitive to their concerns and open to their concerns. And this is where this off the cuff, uh, um, I don't know, whiteness, which is not even thought about as such. People just don't really think about this. That's the problem. Uh, it can be quite a dangerous thing for the future of Russian startups in the world. Thank you so much, uh, stuff. It's been a very interesting uh, lecture, I hope, for especially for our Indonesian friends and colleagues, since not many, again, I, I've mentioned it to Fiatestov before, not many Indonesians are uh, aware of what happens in Russia. And I think uh, your, your uh, presentation, your explanation at least uh, shows that there are uh, aspects of what happened in Russia that is actually very similar to what happened in Indonesia, I would say, uh, uh, especially regarding race and uh, the way the, the central government actually views uh, this Black Lives Matter movement uh, in the US, uh, Indonesian government also have this, this kind of problems with its own uh, uh, racial discrimination inside Indonesia, which, which could, I don't know, which could probably be a good comparative studies in the future. And I thank Fiatestov uh, for his time uh, in this kind of uh, gloomy morning in Tartu in Estonia. Uh, people might have uh, stay sleepy, <laughs> you know. But 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 again, thank you for all the questions. Uh, thank you for uh, the comments uh, from from all the participants. Thank you for again for Fiatestov and for for some of my friends who have helped organize this uh, six lecture series. We do have another. Uh, another discussion next week with uh, Professor Naomi Chi from uh, from Hokkaido University. It's about the the living under COVID nineteen in East Asia. So that will be a, a, another different uh, way of uh, seeing the world, uh, especially still uh, going back to the COVID nineteen. But it's uh, it's it's more about what happened to the to the uh, daily life of people there. Uh, so it's 17th of July, 2020, at the same time, Friday, uh, 2 p.m. Jakarta time. So uh, you can register uh, to our Zoom uh, registration system right after this. Uh, once again, uh, before we uh, end the discussion, I would like to ask all the participants to turn on their video so we could have a group picture together. <laughs> that's, that's the usual thing we do. Uh, we do have a lot of... Uh, a professor from our department. So uh, just to uh, 
recognize their pa- Muntakin, uh, my, my head of department. Okay, uh, thank so. you very much for the lecture. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Pa- pa- Parene also, thank you so much for attending and asking questions. Uh, the other, we could uh, turn videos and take pictures. Uh, Demas, could you organize it? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I will take a picture in uh, in a moment uh, for the other participants. Hopefully, uh, please turn on your camera. Okay, so some of them I, I, I intentionally turn off their videos. I might have to turn them on by myself. Let's see. Uh, okay, if there if there are anyone there is anyone that cannot start their video, just let me know. I might have to turn it on. Some of them there is no camera. Oh, probably, yeah. yeah. Some of them <laughs> don't have camera. Okay, so, okay. Uh, okay, some of us are still keeping with the social distancing requirement and the mask. Okay. <laughs> the okay. mask, I think. Uh, one Especially of my in the office, yeah. My, my colleague, uh, Anissa, is, from South, uh, is now in South Korea, in Seoul, so probably you have to wear the mask. Yeah, I'm with my friend from Tartu. Okay, so... <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay they must could you take... Okay, um, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will take the picture in three, two, one. Okay, it's done. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, thank you so much for everyone time. to attend this session. And thank you again, Fiesta, for, for this time. Uh, we'll see you on our next uh, lecture series on Japan and South Korea. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank mm-hmm. you.